Hello and welcome once again to another session of College English 103, Section 3005. I, as always, am your inimitable host, Mr. Fowler, and I'm so happy that you were able to join me this week. Let's go ahead and move over to our course homepage. Whoa. Let's move over to our course homepage so we can see what's going on for today. I'm gonna adjust my camera for a moment. Okay. Um, well, technical difficulty here, let's try that again. Yeah, this is what I wanted to see. So you can see me up here in your uh, right hand corner. And for today, week three, we have a quick preview and review of what's on the agenda for today's session, including a Zoom presentation. Um, specifically today, I want to go through and process some of the material about the student self-assessment essay. Specifically, I want to read an example from a former student who was in the same class reading the same books and completing the same content. I want to look at how one of those past students accomplished this task to help prepare us for the writing of our own papers. Then um, I want to pause for a moment, and have you reflect, think about what issues or concerns did this sample student address in the essay and ask yourself whether or not you share any of these same concerns. And if so, which ones are they? Then we're going to have a quick word about commas as a warm up for our grammatical component. Then outside of today's lecture video, uh, you'll need to respond to the thread of discussion for week three. A couple of you uh, have already chimed in and I thought you did an excellent job addressing this question. That question is again, in Ready Player One, we're introduced to a group of players in the Easter egg hunt. Uh, th those Alternate players hired by corporate IOI managers are referred to as the Sixers, a group of biologists who scan the oasis for all kinds of information leading to the egg. Now, arguably, the Sixers methods are very similar to those of plagiarists. So here's what I want you to do. Compare the ways in which the Sixers operate in the oasis to the way contemporary plagiarists operate online in the larger marketplace then have you ever been tempted to plagiarize? Why or why not? If not, why do you think or why do you feel, might be a better way to ask it, that students um, are compelled to plagiarize in the first place? What's motivating them? Is it just laziness and boredom or is it something a little bit more understandable? Is it frustration? Is it fear? Is it a mistake? that they make um, with formatting. I don't know, you tell me and we can discuss that in the discussion brackets. Okay, lastly, spend some time this week formatting and setting up the um, self-assessment essay. Now the draft is not due this week, I don't believe, I think it's due next week, but this is the last week that we're gonna have the actually draft, okay? So we had our introduction week, We've had our introductory reading week. So now we're in the planning stages. Okay, so this is planning week and we'll draft next week and things will be due. Then we'll peer review and uh, revise. So four weeks in that uh, scenario and we're just about there. So keep that in mind as you head into next week. So as I said here, prepare the best draft you can for the self-assessment essay. And that's going to be due on February 12th at around 11.59 p.m. Okay, so just before midnight. All right. Now that's a, a preview of today. As a review, I wanna go back and uh, discuss 
what we did in week two. And as you can see in week two, we read the article about participatory cultures. And I wrapped up the discussion uh, just this morning before starting the video. So I thought you all did a fine job. And the reason I think it should be apparent now that we've gotten to the reading as to why Wade Watts is so fascinated by this idea is that the popular culture of his era or learning about the popular culture of the era, more specifically of James Halliday, carries with it its own sense of reward. And his fascination and preoccupation even with that popular culture and the references left by Halliday are the main means by which our hero, Wade Watts, is going to exercise the knowledge necessary to win, to achieve in this game. So we talked about your personal uh, fandoms, and I was happy to see that I've got a lot of sports fans and Chicago sports fans specifically. Uh, but I also have lots of fans of uh, shows like uh, Supernatural. There are fans of uh, television series like, um, not... I almost said the wrong thing, like Criminal Minds. I have people who are fans of, um, you know, of music, various musical genres and, and groups that I hadn't heard of before. So it was enlightening to hear uh, some new music, kind of a fun way to get into the start of the swing of the semester. And then we talked about the way that there are some female specific fandoms that are a little bit different. They're more creative meaning they might create a fan video or fan fiction or a cosplay or something like that. Whereas typically more male fans or more male dominated fan bases will engage in the purchasing of items, uh, jerseys, uh, some kind of knickknack, or uh, they'll express their fandom through a uh, handle of knowledge about statistics or uh, a particular player's skill set. So we call those activities curative. One thing that I wanted to point out though is that the authors of our article do admit that while some females are more curative and some males also engage in uh, more creative endeavors, the two are not mutually exclusive. So you will have um, guys who write fan fiction. You will have more creative people who are engaged in that fa those fan-related processes. And you will have female fandoms who are just more interested in the just the facts approach to their um, fandom of choice. So I wanted to make sure that that was clear. There was some debate back and forth about that on the discussion thread. So I wanted to clarify that. Okay, now, Let's go ahead. I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. Now you're going to lose this wonderful visual, but I, I hope you can get through it. Besides, you'll still have these dulcet tones to listen to uh, as we progress. All right, let's go ahead and start. I'm going to stop the video. You should still hear me, though, as we go ahead and share the screen. So the first thing I wanted to talk to you about was just uh, revisiting the uh, composition essay. Now I've gone over this quite a bit already, but I just want to go over some of the particulars. Again, draft is going to be due on February 12th before midnight. The final exam is going to be due on the 26th. Now, I said the wrong thing right there, so don't panic. The final, not exam, but the final draft is going to be due right before the end of the month um, on the 26th. Now, those are both Fridays, so you should have more than enough time to get that material uh, completed. Remember that it's uh, clocking in at about 500 words. That's roughly two pages. It might not be too full or two complete pages, but it's going to be more than one, okay? So I gave the best estimate that I could. 
Uh, remember, we're going to talk about the format in just a few seconds. What exactly are we going to do? We're going to propose an essay describing how your academic and writing strengths will help you succeed in this class, along with how you're um, going to meet any academic or writing challenges that would prove to be obstacles for you. When you discuss the obstacles that you may have, and that's totally fine to have an obstacle or two, try to include the strategy or plan to overcome that obstacle. Try to use specific examples along with information from the course syllabus. For example, you may want to identify a specific essay assignment in this class that you expect to do well in and explain why that that's the case. You also may want to describe the source of your academic writing strengths and weaknesses. You may think about it as telling the story of how you acquired a useful skill and how you may have, by contrast, developed a bad habit. The essay has multiple purposes. Most importantly, it gives you an opportunity to explore the course requirements and make plans to meet those requirements that are involved drawing on your existing strengths and create realistic strategies for you to overcome your challenges. By the same token, it also gives you a chance to reflect on how your literacy and writing skills have developed over the years, which is an incredibly valuable endeavor at the start of the semester in a writing class. If you want to write a formally structured persuasive essay, that's okay. Alternatively, and this is for those of you who like the more personal style of writing, you may wish to structure your essay like a narrative. And this is our narrative writing essay for the semester. Um, and again, you could just simply tell the story of how you acquired your strengths and weaknesses. Sort of a focus on your education as it relates to the process of writing. Now, let's look at how one student went about doing that very thing. Grab it wrong. Try it again. Okay, so this is a sample student essay, and you can see right away, and again, I need to preview the fact that we're going to talk about this. They have that single spaced four line list with student's name, student blank, and the purposes of anonymity. Uh, the class, you can see this is from an earlier section. 2011, which was in the fall um, of 2016. And they did give the name of the assignment, self-assessment essay, and the date it was submitted. In this case, August 25th, 2019. So they have all of those necessary requirements. Then they pressed enter or return. They used the center tool and they completed an original title that's not in italics and it's not used in bold. Okay. They created something where growth through writing. That's the title. One last element to uh, concern ourselves with is that in the upper right hand corner of the page, they did include a page number. You can also include your last name here if you wish, but it's not necessary for the papers. We're going to write this semester. Okay, so that's the basics of the layout. Notice that the rest of the text is double spaced, but there's no extra double space between this first paragraph and the first body paragraph. Okay, so you can read this and I will let you read it, but I do think reading the first and the final paragraph are pretty important. Okay, so they begin by saying, or writing rather, that after having read the syllabus and listened to the class discussions that followed, it seems quite straightforward uh, what, of what the teachings and expectations of the course will be, of what the teachings and expectations of the course will be. Not bad, I totally understand what's being said, but this student has performed a pretty classic misstep here in that they have written a solid essay, but they failed to go back and revisit the first sentence. The first sentence is 
sort of like the first impression uh, that you get when you meet somebody. So going back and doing a little bit of massaging on the first sentence after you're done is a good idea. Let's experiment with that right now. So after having registered and listened to the in-class discussion that followed, that's fine. We've got a good comment here, and that's indicating that there is a preposition after at the beginning of the sentence. So this is all a preposition phrase. And then we get into the main clause of the sentence. It seems quite straightforward. We're tripping up with this word of. We don't need it. It seems quite straightforward what the and we even what the teachings and expectations of the course would be. That's fine, but why wouldn't you just say that um, the expectations of the course seem straightforward? In fact, we can even get rid of that other the course expectations seem quite straightforward. That looks much better. Let's try it with that first sentence revised. After having read the syllabus and listened to the in-class discussion that followed, the course expectations seem quite straightforward. Good. Throughout the syllabus, it states that writing proficiency, research proficiency, mechanics, and format, and revision will be touched upon and honed in by each student taking the course. Again, a fairly straightforward sentence. It could be a little bit better. We don't need to say honed in by each student. We'll be honed. And we're going to do a little bit more than touch upon certain things. Okay, so let's say throughout the syllabus, it states that writing proficiency, so let's say writing and research, writing and research proficiency. As well as, uh, as well as mechanics, uh, formatting, and paper revision will be central topics. Oops. Microphone's in the way. Central topics. Um, period. Each student taking the course will be expected to revisit these skills and hone in on their usage. Again, not perfect, but a little bit better. While I may not feel the need to go over all these topics, it will help in the long run because each teacher leaves a profound impression on the way you learn and how you think as an individual. So right here, again, we have this term while. If you don't know, while is a dependent clause or dependent conjunction. And when you place it at the beginning of the sentence, you're going to require a comma that will bridge it to the standalone or independent clause of the sentence. Now, a good way to get rid of that if you don't want to uh, focus on commas overmuch is to just eliminate it by saying 
I may not feel the need to go over all of these topics. However, so semicolon, however, it will help in the long run because each teacher leaves a profound impression on the way you think as an individual. Do you need the comma here before because? Not necessarily, but if you're an old school student of Strunk and White, they would tell you to go ahead and include the comma. So the, I'll leave it for right now. After the completion of this class, I hope to gain a new perspective and to have improved my basic writing in all of the areas touched upon so I may continue to use them in the courses and endeavors for years to come. I th think that's fine. Um, probably need a comma here because so is a coordinating conjunction. So I'll mention that to that student. To be honest, again, you, if you're going to use an infinitive, to be honest, you probably need to have a comma at the beginning because that's what's referred to as an introductory phrase. It's not a full verb to be. It's sort of um, standing in for a better verb that could be processed there. So instead, I would say my interest in writing is limited or to be honest, question or comma, uh, you know, just as I've been indicating here. That does create a need for more commas than I think um, are necessary. So I would again edit this to just say, my interest in writing is limited, comma, but I still see it as a useful tool to have as an individual. You don't need to incorporate that phrase to be honest, because why would I expect you would be anything other than honest? Or why would any reader expect a writer to be something other than honest? It's kind of begging the question, right? so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, I am as prepared as high school can make me for this course. Perfect sentence there. Okay. For this reason, a nice, you know, transitional phrase. Um, again, is it necessary? No, but if you're going to include it, you do have to have that comma. I plan on taking this course very seriously and making sure I strengthen what I already excel at and improve in my very shortcomings. And I said here, as the paragraph reflective idea, don't worry about the missing commas, make the changes, but realize there aren't points deducted this time. Okay, the student has issues with introductory comma elements and parallelism within the bounds of his writing. And I don't use his just as a pejorative term. This was a male student, so uh, that's just for your edification. So now he should be talking about some of the key components in this first paragraph that would reflect the rest of the content in the body paragraphs that follow. Okay. Writing is a useful tool. That's one. Okay. He still sees writing as a useful tool. He is as prepared for high school could make him. Uh, let me see here. That's good. And then uh, I, he plans to take this course serial, seriously and make sure he can strengthen the art and improve his shortcomings. And we'll make that gray. Now, those three ideas should match up nicely to the focal points of the next couple of paragraphs. When it comes to English writing, it's not my strongest area or my favorite or my favorite one. Okay. I struggle with using punctuation at correct times and occasionally struggle with run-on sentences. All right, so if we skip ahead, we should say something about high school preparation. Um, but we don't. We see he's already wrapping things up. So let's see here. Maybe it's within the space of this body paragraph. Yeah, here it is. I'm usually able to turn in good work. I just really need someone to read my paper before its final submission. All right. So we have something akin here. 
On the other hand, one of my strengths is that I rarely struggle with getting stuck on a paper and not knowing what's right. And I also enjoy researching most of the topics that I've had for papers in the past. So again, he reiterates these three previewed uh, concerns. My end goal is really a simple one. I wish to pass the class to the grade, maybe learn a thing or two along the way. This will help me as I continue through school and later move on to a career. I understand the requirements and expectations of this class, and I plan on fulfilling my part as the student uh, to the best of my abilities. I hope to come out of this class with applicable skills from the real world rather than gain knowledge I would use for a year or two and then never revisit. And we end with comments from myself. You have created a very efficient evaluation of the strengths and weaknesses in your writing style. I very much appreciate the fact that you've also done an effective job identifying some strategies to correct these issues. And notice he did hit the 500 word mark, 655. You can see here that page two is pretty much um, on par. I did note a few grammar mechanics issues. Two fragments, there was an example of one that was corrected and some comma issues. The controlling idea of the essay was clear and you seem to possess solid writing skills and introduce strategies to address the deficits for your reader. I enjoyed reading about your strengths and I predict that the ideas and strategies you discuss in the class will help you on your journey. So in terms of content, that content was logical and met the uh, specifications of the essay. It was the appropriate length. 655 words here. The layout and the sentence structure and the variety, eh, there was a lot to be considered for a first draft here, which is actually fairly typical. And then for grammar, spelling, and mechanics, eh, you know, not too terrible, but certainly enough things to distract from the eye and sort of confuse the reader in certain uh, passages. So all told, you got about an 18 out of 25, which is a, a C. That's pretty typical. Now, I want to tell you that I picked a version of a paper that I knew had some, some struggles, that uh, had some problems, because I don't expect that you all have as much trouble as this particular student, but you may have more problems than you uh, may have originally anticipated. So one of that student's issues was uh, problems with commas. Okay, so I want to end today with a little discussion about commas. And this is called <laughs> commas until you cry. And of course, we know that this is a crocodile because it's there are crocodile tears that are being cried, which means they're big, but not genuine tears because it's not really that bad. Okay. So here's the thing. A lot of students have been given this bad advice over the years. And, you know, I think high school and middle school teachers have a tough job and they do the very best that they can. I know that was true in my own experience, but I also know that my instructors said the same thing as this message right here. There's not a handbook in the world for in English that's going to suggest that you use commas whenever you pause. The way that we speak and the way that we hear others speak is in no way related to and should not reflect our writing because we all have different speech inflections and patterns. So if we left commas to that device, everyone would have a lot of different punctuation going on. Okay. So as you can see here, this guy may say blah, 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 then pause, then another set of blahs and pause and so on and so forth. Whereas I might not pause as much or I might pause more frequently. So again, don't do that. Instead, you should be conscientious of the rules. There are only six of them, and they're pretty straightforward. 
using multiple commas will hook your reader's eyes unnecessarily. So if you have any doubt about whether or not to use a comma, don't. The idea moving forward from 2021 is to be more sparing with commas in, to, in general. But knowing when and where to place commas can actually help you create more successful sentences, just as carefully as an architect would plan a skyscraper. Each sentence part that follows will, depending on its location, connect with a comma. And of course, we start with prepositional phrases. A favorite of, of many students, especially as they use prepositional phrases, like in the example, at the beginning of sentences. Sentences that begin with a preposition, which is a word that shows location and place or time, right, which you can remember as position, um, are needed, okay, um, at the beginning of a sentence for a transition. They might include optional description as well. And they always tend to end with a noun. Here are some examples. The tasty poodle went over direction, my tongue, noun, so it ends with a comma, down direction, my throat, noun, ends in a comma, and into direction, my stomach, ends in a noun. There are also participle or ing or ed ending phrases. So present and past participles is just a fancy term to say present ing or gerund phrases or past ed or d phrases or participles. They also might include modifiers that are uh, added on to finish the thought. Ground, like hamburger, boiling in the swamp water, seasoned with garlic, the tasty poodle simmered in a pot. And no, I don't have anything personal against poodles. It's just a funny example. We also have infinitive phrases, which I mentioned in the student example which is to combine with a form of a verb. They might also include modifiers to finish thoughts. To eat another tasty poodle or to be satisfied with just that one. Hmm. Not quite a Shakespearean uh, query, but close enough. You may also find the need for a comma when you use a a positive. Now, and a positive is pretty easy to suss out and fairly rare in student writing. But if you want to take advantage of an appositive, you could feel free to do so. An appositive is simply a noun that renames another noun, like my mom, Bonnie. Okay, we would say my mom, comma, Bonnie, comma, because that's my mom's name. You know, uh, she is a very good cook, right? That'd be a full sentence using an appositive. And a positive comes either right before or right after the noun it describes. A po the poodle, a yapping furball, was not as tasty as the human foot I snagged last week. Oof. You could also use commas to indicate nouns of direct address. A noun of direct address is a name, basically. It indicates who is receiving the information. Removing the noun of direct address will not change the meaning of the sentence, but if you do create it, you know you need a comma. Marvin, Mr. Trump, dad, sweetheart. Right? Would all be examples. So here's what we're saying. Compare the sentences. I have already eaten Marvin. Sounds psychotic, right? Well, it <laughs> it would if you were not, you know, a, uh, an alligator or a crocodile, rather. Uh, whoa. But if you say, no, thank you. I've already eaten Martin and you're addressing directly Martin, who is your server here, your waiter, then that's not so strange. 
well, it's pretty strange if you're a crocodile and you're talking, period, but I think you get my drift. Adverbs. Uh, an adverb is a word component that modifies a verb, it modifies an adjective, or can actually out, uh, modify another additional adverb. Sometimes these are frequently called LY words. Okay, but that's not a proviso covering every adverb under the sun. In terms of comma placement, you need to worry less about those adverbs um, in general, but more so about those which act as transitions between sentences or paragraphs. Unfortunately, comma, poodles give me indigestion. I think most of us would make that grab pretty easy. But look at the second example. The fact, comma, however, comma, will not keep me from eating them. That's a little more rare in my experience as a writing instructor. So if you've already mastered that or this is second nature to you, good for you. But if you haven't, it's something to consider as you, you start writing and revising your papers. Now, a subordinate clause is simply a clause that uses a subordinate conjunction or weakens a standard clause or main clause by lacking one of the constituent elements. Remember that a complete sentence has a subject and a verb and expresses a complete thought. Now, a subordinate clause will not do one of those three things. Typically, conjunctions of a subordinate nature, such as although, because, if, when, and while, are usually used at the beginning of a sentence and are followed by a comma. Remember that subordinate clauses can include a subject and verb, but usually don't express a complete thought if they were left on their own. If you ever fall off a boat, well, you know, while I'm swimming nearby, neither of those express complete thoughts, but they do have a subject. You and what is the action? Fall. Okay. We also have um, an adverb ever uh, defining ever fall. In the second example, I and then uh, am swimming is your verb. So subject I am swimming, right? But the presence of while and if um, throw them off. Now, if we got rid of those and we were just left with, hey, you ever fall off a boat? You could turn that into a question. Or I'm swimming nearby. You could turn that into a full sentence. Maybe not the best sentences in the world, but um, it's the presence of those phrases at the beginning, if and while, those subordinate phrases which turn the clause subordinate. So they necessitate a comma. Lastly, we have speaker tags, and these are probably the easiest kinds of commas. They are used to introduce direct quotations and typically include both a subject and a verb. Then my doctor said, comma, poodles are bad for your health. So let's, again, quickly review the comma tips. All introductory elements require comma when they're connected to a main clause. It looks like this. Introduction, comma, main clause. Because she's short, Francine loves to go shopping with Rachel, a tall friend. Strolling down the aisles, Francine asks Rachel to grab packages of imported crackers and boxes of high fiber cereal, items that are always too high to reach. So we have the presence of because, and that should be a big alarm bell. So because she is short, comma. Okay. Now we have the main clause. Francine loves to go shopping. Francine loves. Francine subject, loves verb. Let's go to the next sentence. Strolling down the aisles, ing gerund or participle phrase at the beginning should be another alarm bell. 
Francine asks Rachel to grab packages of converter crackers and boxes of high fiber cereal items that are hard, they're always too high to reach. On top of the computer monitor in the bedroom, a collection of stuffed unicorns supervises the work Lori completes at the keyboard below. This is a really tricky one. Think about it for a second. This is tough because you have two phrases stacked one on top of another. On top, right, of the computer. You may want to put a comma here because there's a noun, but you also have um, in the bedroom, pretty tricky. So you have another prepositional phrase after the first prepositional phrase. And you have bedroom, the noun, and that's where it goes this time. Akram has a problem hitting the snooze button on his alarm over and over. To get to his first class on time, Akram frequently eats a donut in the car, getting crumbs all over the seat of his new vehicle. So again, the first one, you might say, do we need a comma after button? No, in this case you don't, because the prepositional phrase is an additional modifier at the end of an already substantiated clause or complete sentence. Akram has a problem. Akram has, subject verb, expresses a complete thought. We have a comma in the second sentence here with the gerund phrases to get to his first class on time. Pablo walked all the way across campus before he noticed the lightness of his book bag. Suddenly, he realized that his heavy chemistry text was on the backseat of his car. Again, the adverb is the uh, necessitates a comma here, L-Y word again, suddenly. In English class, no one wants to sit next to Eli because he's always smacking his gum loudly. Moreover, he nervously swings his leg, kicking people in the thighs, shins, and ankles. So we have a couple here, an English class, comma, no one wants to sit next to Eli because he's always smacking his gum loudly. And then moreover, the transitional phrase or transitional adverb also necessitates a comma. So we have a perfect example of a preposition in English class. Preposition in ends in a class, a noun, we need a comma. And then moreover is pretty uh, blatant, I think. Only one more sentence part to learn. Non-essential clauses. And again, students typically don't create non-essential clauses. But when and if you do, it's important to realize how to use the comma correctly. Non-essential clauses typically give more information about a noun or a subject of a sentence and typically begin with who, whoever, whom or whoever, where or wherever or which or whichever. They usually contain a subject and a verb, as in this example. I can still eat poodle dinners, which I really enjoy in moderation. So here's comma tip two. All kinds of interrupters require commas in front and behind when they break up the flow of a complete set sentence like this. You could also think of them as scoopable uh, components, right? Notice how a comma looks a little bit like an ice cream scoop. You could scoop the interrupter out and have the sentence still make sense. Here's, here are some examples. George used War and Peace a heavy, thick, intimidating book to smash the cockroaches he found on the walls of his college dorm room. War and Peace and book. Now, we also have commas separating thick and heavy here because they're modifiers, which all, along with intimidating, which all reference book. If you've got three like this, you need to add extra commas. If you only have two, a heavy, you know, a heavy intimidating book, probably don't need commas. 
take this soup bone, Joe, and give it to the puppy before he starts chewing our shoes. Now you probably heard it that time, but obviously Joe is a noun, a direct address and an interrupter here. So we have to have a comma before Joe and after. When you get hungry, my mother announced, I want you to throw a bowl of this squid eyeball stew. So obviously there should be a comma after hungry and one after announced because that's a dialogue tag or a form of interrupter. Professor Finkelstein, who assigns more papers than he has time to grade, keeps student essays half a semester before returning them. So again, a noun and direct address, but in this case, it's what we were just talking about. It's one of those phrases that begins who. So Professor Finkelstein, comma, who assigns more papers than he has time to grade, comma, keeps student essays half a semester before returning them. So uh, in this case, you have a scoopable phrase because if we got rid of that material, you would have Professor Finkelstein keeps student essays half a semester before returning them. So another way you can try to remember uh, these phrases. January, the month Julie usually dreads because of its cold, dark mornings, was unusually warm this past year. I wish that were the case for us. But again, comma after January and after year, or sorry, mornings, um, is a pretty uh, obvious uh, placement. Comma tip number three. Concluding elements require a comma when they're connected at the end of a main clause. Jennifer tolerated the family reunion, comma, slapping mosquitoes with a paper plate and drinking the iced tea to combat the heat. Again, ing, that's a gerund or a participle phrase that comes at the end of a sentence. Just add it on. In a panic, Tony searched the interior of his car. That one's fine. He hoped to find his biology lab work under the front seat or among the clutter in his trunk. That seems okay. No concluding element, no comma necessary. At Tito's Taco Palace, James tried to keep the pace with Theodore, who can eat a burrito in 30 seconds flat. So again, who? is a key idea. It's setting off one of those uh, additional phrases. Don't bother to ask mom or Sue. She never extends curfew, especially if you hear, if you tell her you will be out uh, with a guy. So again, dialogue tags, especially in this case is an L-Y word or adverb that uh, establishes an extra component. At the West Oak Mall food court, Aisha winked at Rodney, a cute young man in a tight t-shirt. In this case, we're creating a noun of direct address and giving more or additional information about Rodney. So he gets a comma and the information that's not necessary, but it, perhaps more interesting, follows. Comment tip four, we're almost done. Use these rules when you use commas and the word and. Complete sentence, comma, and, and finish the other complete sentence. That's what's referred to as a compound sentence. And that is a frequently used device by students. If you use two items and link them together the and, a comma is not necessary. If you use three or more items with and, as in a list, then you do need commas to separate those individual items. Sometimes it's referred to as an Oxford comma. Tony wanted to order a pizza from the Pizza Hutch and some shrimp fried rice from YY's Cantonese kitchen. So pizza from the Pizza Hutch and some fried shrimp, that should be okay. <laughs> Yeah, and it is. Debbie rushed to get to the report typed and Martha frantically answered the phones. 
now we have two compound sentences, or well, two sentences rather, forming a compound sentence. Debbie rushed and Martha answered. Subject, verb, subject, verb. So there should be a comma before, after typed. Pretty easy. I don't know when to leave my credit card at home. When to say no to a cheeseburger with fries. Well, it seems like it should just be a comma after home, but notice the presence of when and when to say no. That's not a complete thought. So I'm gonna guess there's no comma needed. And I'm right. When Mike took his truck to the dealership, the mechanics wanted to put in a new starter, replace his shocks, and overhaul his transmission. We should probably have a comma after shocks. That's the Oxford comma. Now, not every instructor, including me, will actually mark that wrong. But if you're talking about the most proper form of grammar, a comma should go there. Because George snores to wake the dead, and because Fuzzball, the dog, barks at the slightest sound, Alice never gets a good night's sleep. I think this one's okay. <laughs> Comma tip number five. Follow these rules when you use those non-essential clauses. The ones that begin with who, whom, and which, or whomever, whichever, and whenever. People who know their grammar rules shouldn't always correct those of us who don't. That's fine. There's no essential, or there's rather no non-essential clause. So there are no commas necessary. Everything there is essential. My brother James, who cannot please dad, has decided to remission. Again, a pretty glaring non-essential clause. Once again, signaled by the word who. Comma after James, comma after dad. The basketball players whom I admire the most play for teams other than the Orlando, Orlando Magic. Okay, so the basketball players whom I admire the most, um, we could get rid of whom I admire the most. The basketball players play for teams other than the Orlando Magic. But if we put commas there, or if we eliminate that phrase, the whole sentence changes. So in this case, I don't think any commas are necessary. The movie Aliens, which I've seen 27 times, contains too much violence for my nephews to watch. Here again, we have a pretty glaring non-essential clause, which I've seen 27 times. You could take that out and be left with just, the movie Aliens contains too much violence for my nephews to watch. So. We flank that with commas. Commas after aliens, commas after times. We watched a crazy kid on a skateboard weave through the heavy traffic on Orange Avenue. The kid, who had no fear of death or litigation, leaped a curb and crashed into a lawyer walking along the sidewalk. Again, who, whom, or which are big signals. So comma after the kid and comma after uh, litigation. Comma tip six, and this is the end of the line. When you have a series of adju adjectives that are describing a noun, you should use commas in this manner. If you have a coordinative adjective followed by another coordinate adjective, you use a comma to separate the two of them. If there's one that's non-coordinative, and a following non-coordinate adjective, a comma is not necessary. Two cluttered computer tables and an unmade sagging bed fill Antonio's small bedroom. Unmade sagging bed, right? They're coordinating. The cute, soft, frisky ferret will bite your fingers if you try to pick him up. Cute. Soft, frisky. Items in a series. Michael's faded, ragged New York Jets jacket was an inappropriate choice of clothing for his second interview at the bank. So let's see here. Faded and ragged both define the jacket. 
but the second interview was not necessary. The hot, comma, spicy, comma, appetizing bowl of squid eyeball stew steamed on the clean, shiny kitchen counter. We don't need to separate squid and eyeball here because they're essential to defining the type of stew. But the fact that it's both hot and spicy and appetizing are distinctive elements. Just as clean and shiny represent the kitchen, which makes it a distinct type of kitchen. A strange smell emanated from Barbara's blue disorganized book bag, which lay on the floor beside her desk. So blue and disorganized probably tell us a lot about the book bag. And they're distinctive, so comma separate them. Last one, and this is tricky. So and so that. So is an example of a coordinating conjunction. So you always, like and, use a comma when you're combining a sentence or you're creating a compound sentence. But when you use so that, you're creating a situation where you don't need a explanation or a pause because you're creating a subordinate clause to finish the complete sentence that preceded it. Robbie bought a small microwave for his first apartment so that he could cook popcorn and macaroni and cheese, the only meal that he could afford. Sylvia wore flat shoes on her date with Tony. Sylvia wore, subject verb, so she wouldn't intimidate the short young man with her height. She intim you know, would intimidate, subject verb, comma after Tony. Oh, implied so that, see, even Mr. Fowler made a mistake there. So that she wouldn't intimidate me, interesting. Yuko bought a small aquarium and some goldfish so that her appointment apartment wouldn't feel so lonely. <laughs> yep, again. Patrick always carries an English handbook with them, even to basketball games, so that, well, it's actually written in this case, he can check other people's grammar. Even to basketball games. So here, this is an interesting one. It has nothing to do with so. It's actually an additional uh, modifier. The comma is for the interrupter, not the so that. Rachel neglected to make her car payment three months in a row. So she must hide her car in friends' garages in an attempt to foil the repo man. Here we have a classic use of so as a coordinating conjunction, comma after row. All right, that's it. Um, and as you can see here, the process for using commas and getting used to all the rules can even fool experts such as myself after a while. But it's important to be able to use commas correctly in order to make sure your meaning is understood. And for the purposes of a class like this one, to make sure that your writing is understood and that you can self-correct these issues in your writing and in the writing of others when and if they occur. Okay, that's it for today. I hope that you're able to get uh, a lot written this week. Um, and I hope that this discussion about the process of writing and the student sample that we've revisited this uh, session will help you get prepared as we start the next phase of our learning. Until next time, this is Mr. Fowler signing off. Have a great week.